I don't understand how we can ultimately dismantle any of it if we don't stick to a to a you know intensely radical politics. You're not broke if you're taxing rich people. We break production for profit and we replace it by production for need. This event is brought to you by Haymarket Books. Now more than ever, it is critical to support independent publishers, independent bookstores, and independent voices. There are two ways you can do this today. First, by buying books from Haymarket at haymarketbooks.org. And secondly, by joining the Haymarket Book Club. The following event will be recorded and shared afterwards on the Haymarket Books YouTube channel. Please subscribe to the channel, like this video now, and share it with as many people as possible. If you like this event, be sure to catch these upcoming events in Haymarket's live stream series. You can register for these upcoming events on the Haymarket Books Eventbrite page. If you miss an event, you can listen to the recording afterward by subscribing to our podcast, Haymarket Live, wherever you get your podcasts. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. We are moderating the chat, but we cannot guarantee that everyone will observe our community guidelines. People who violate these guidelines will have their comments deleted as quickly as we are able. This event will have live closed captions. Instructions for accessing the captions will be posted in the chat. We should have time for Q&A. So please post your questions in the YouTube chat window, and we'll get to those later in the program. Thanks for joining us today. Our event will begin shortly. I'm humbled and honored to be with you all um, for this event. We'll start off with um, just a few introductions for this talk, Palestine 1492, Settler Colonialism, Solidarity and Resistance. Uh, peace be upon you all. Uh, I requested from uh, my fellow kumpas whether I could recite prayer or not. And it's Moses' prayer in the Quran. Allahumma shrah li sadri wa yassir li umri wa hlil uqtatil min lisani afqal qawli. Allahumma shrah li sadri means, uh, may creator, may you open thy breast. Wa yassir li umri and make our affairs easy. Wa hlil uqtatil min lisani afqal qawli and undo the knot in our tongues such that our speeches uh, become accessible to you all. Um, I'm very deeply honored uh, to introduce my fellow kumpas, uh, Linda uh, Pikovich is a geographer and seed saver based in California. She places her university training at the service of under-resourced communities in the U.S., Mexico, and Philistine, who seek clean water, land, and tools to build and strengthen their collective autonomies. She's author of the forthcoming, which I'm very looking forward to, Palestine 1492, that's coming out, inshallah, in 2024. You can learn more about her work at kiki.org. Uh, the amazing William C. Anderson is a writer and activist from Birmingham, Alabama. His work has appeared in The Guardian, MTV, Truthout, British Journal of Photography, and Pitchfork, amongst others. He is the author of The Nation on No Map, 
AK Press 2021 and co-author of As Black as Resistance, AK Press 2018. He's also the co-founder of Offshoot Journal and provides creative direction as a producer of the Black Autonomy podcast. His writing have been his writings have been featured and included in the anthologies Who Do You Serve? Who Do You Protect? Haymarket 2016, and No Self to Defend, which was edited uh, by Mariam Kaba in 2014. My name is Mohamed Abdo. I'm a North African and Egyptian Muslim anarchist and interdisciplinary scholar activist um, <clears throat> of Indigenous Black critical race and Islamic studies, as well as gender, sexuality, abolition, and decolonization. Did extensive uh, research and field work in the Middle East, North Africa, Asia, and Turtle Island. This year, I'm a professor at Columbia University, and I previously taught at Cornell University, the American University of Cairo, as well as uh, the University of Toronto and Queen's University. Uh, most of my work is derived out of uh, the post-anti-globalization Seattle 1999 movements, as well as organizing for Palestinian uh, liberation my involvement with the Tantanega Mohawks and the sister territories of Kanawake, Akwasasne, and Kanasatake during the standoff over the Culberstone track, as well as anti-war protests uh, uh, of Iraq and Afghanistan. I was also involved with the indigenous Zapatista movement in Chiapas, as well as the 2011 uprisings. And I am the author of Islam and Anarchism, uh, Relationships and Resonances that was published by Pluto in 2022. I'd like to thank, uh, just straight off the bat, Haymarket Square, or Haymarket Books, sorry, uh, and because this is part of the Until Liberation series for Palestine uh, by them. So with that, I'll leave you in the hands of William, uh, who will be speaking for a little bit, uh, and then after that, Linda, and then after that, myself. Hey, everyone. Um, thanks for the introductions, Mohammed. Uh, it's really an honor to share space with you both. I have a lot of respect for you. Um, and talking about this uh, with you feels very appropriate because I know that you have such um, amazing and generative uh, perspectives to offer. And today I'm going to just kind of open this up by uh, doing something a little different than I typically would. I'm going to read a reflection uh, that I wrote for this uh, because I wanted to share something uh, pretty focused. So first and foremost, all love and solidarity to the Palestinian struggle. Their cause is a special one to many people like myself because it helped to reveal the true nature of U.S. society and the world we live in to me as a young organizer. Um, this contributed immensely to my political development over time. When I was younger, my understanding of the world was limited. I didn't necessarily see people or populations for what they are. I saw government, borders, and political leadership. International relations and inevitable crises were filtered through the most visible representations of the world as we know it now. Nation and state were the guiding categories that shaped my understanding of struggle. However, this changed because of certain encounters that I had that opened up my perspective. One of the primary encounters was with the history of Palestinian resistance that pushed me further in my radicalization. What happens when groups of people are dispossessed and disinherited? What happens when they are made stateless? The terms of citizenship that offer some and not others sort of political legitimacy on the world stage are not equally shared. Some people migrate or are forcibly taken or forcibly moved and become undocumented based on where they end up. Home can become a different place because we change locations or because locations change around us. People can be stolen or stolen from or both and much more. Even the mundane things we take for granted can be taken away from us. The water we drink, the facade of a building, the plants that grow around us, who our neighbors are, all mean something. The language we utilize to describe home is made up of familiarities and intimacies that life gives to us. Colonization, conquest, and imperialism strip that away. The violence erases and rearranges our communal environment to such an extent 
that we could end up being considered strangers in our own homes. Palestine helped me to see this in new ways because it showed me how groups of people abroad become expendable for the purposes of empire. Palestine helped me to learn this at an early age because it taught me about US military aid to Israel, understanding that the money that's extracted from me and those around me enables genocidal onslaught was a crisis. It showed me that some of the assumptions that I made about what freedom meant had to be reconsidered. As a descendant of enslaved Africans, I had long considered a comprehensive awareness of genealogy, nation, and homeland to be liberatory. And though my family taught me enough native history for me to understand how genocidal expansion can take that away, the long genocide waged against Palestinians helped me to see even more yet again. For years, we've witnessed the outrages against Palestinians carried out with a regularity and a normalcy that's been that's a clearly that's clearly an effort to eradicate a population. Apartheid, bombardment, disappearances, kidnapping, and imprisonment have been carried out for generations. And even in the face of immeasurable egregious violence, there have been those who dare to fight in a plethora of ways. The methods at their disposal often dictated by the fact that Zionist conquest and settlement have pushed backs against the wall. For those of us who have looked on in shock and dismay, questions about solidarity arise. How do we intervene and how do we show support to lend ourselves to a fight against genocide? I think one of the first important realizations we can have is where we are on the map that's been drawn at so many people's expense. Our location is not meaningless and it informs how we should or should not offer a perspective. It tells us what actions we should take. It does not make us better than those who are trying to resist and survive in any way possible. For those of us inside of empire and throughout what's called the West, we are not so exceptional that our politics or visibility makes us superior to those in the midst of horrors, both seen and unseen. Massacres should not be rendered an opportunity for content creation, pompous editorials, and ideological posturing. Palestine is not an egotistical point for us to make about the evils of this world. It's a struggle where people are fighting for their very lives and well-being and history. They're determining what makes sense to see the next day. So we must understand that self-determination does not mean I determine for yourself what's best for you. It does not mean self-appointed vanguardism. Palestinian resistance and the multitudes of people experiencing genocide around the world are not a whiteboard for us to write our ideas onto. They are not a problem for us to highlight the practicality of our proposed solutions. Self-determined groups of people do just that. They determine the methods and actions they would like to take up around their plight. So much of the words and rhetoric to re-entrench what we might imagine we're right about do not feed starving children. They do not sanitize water or anesthetize fully conscious patients under the servant surgeon's knife. They don't dig families out from under rubble or shield people from bombardment. And that's not to say words and ideas are useless. They're certainly not. I'm talking right now too, of course, offering my own thoughts. But what strikes me is the severed connection between theory and praxis that freezes some of us in our tracks. Though we all play different roles in struggle, 
some of us are tasked with animating the words that slide off of revolutionary tongues to translate the language of overthrow. Words like sabotage, conspiracy, trespass, topple, dismantle, and overpower need us to make them a reality. What's apparent is there is a world full of people ready to fight for Palestine, whether their supposedly representative governments oblige that call to action or not. If people were in direct control of our destinies without the barriers of state violence, how different would things look? What if we represented ourselves directly instead of having our desires filtered through systematic denial disguised as democracy. Amy Césaire said something that I keep hearing in my head, quote, at the present time, the world is at an impasse. This can only mean one thing, not that there is no way out, but the time has come to abandon the old ways, which have led to fraud, tyranny, and murder, end quote. Here before many of us stands a warning too. Israel is one of the possibilities of what can happen when oppression, injustice, and long suffering become essential innocence and inherent correctness. When nation, faith, ideology, religion, and ethnic fraternity begin to mean superiority there's a measurable danger ahead, no matter what people have been through. You can mix that with the colonial trappings of the formation we know as the state, a monopoly on violence. And Israel is one example of the unforgivable terrors that can be produced. The revolutionary black anarchist, Martin Sostre wrote that it was important that we not quote, obscure the basic contradiction that between Zionism and a European settler ideology, a European settler ideology concretized as Israel and the native indigenous peoples of Palestine, end quote. Not only was Martin reflecting on the situation at hand, he was drawing inspiration from it. In Thoughts of a Black Political Prisoner in Solitary Confinement from 1969, he discusses his proposal of a prisoner exchange and specifically talks about Israel as an exclusivist settler colonial ethnostate. He talks about an exchange of Palestinian guerrillas and hostages in a way that is obviously strikingly familiar to what many of us are thinking about and witnessing right now. It's a reminder that much of what we're seeing is the established colonial norms and arrangements of hegemony and domination coming back around. Martin Sostre's words have helped me to think about what solidarity really means. He wrote, quote, although every oppressed people must of necessity conduct their struggle for liberation within the confines of their own locality where they are being oppressed, they must never lose sight of the of the universality of the war of liberation, end quote. So I just wanted to offer this small reflection here about the ways that Palestine positions us and challenges us to rethink everything about this planet. When Sostre was taking note of Palestinian prisoner swaps, he also said, quote, knowing that the white racist oppressor is no respecter of law, not even his own law, and being in rebellion against him precisely because of our people, because our people have always, always been oppressed and victimized by the white man's justice, law and order, end quote, wasn't enough alone for black political prisoners like himself. He said understanding that the white man's law was designed to carry out the violence against us as it already stands was imperative. 
And when I read how he develops that analysis from looking at Palestinians, I see a broader condemnation of international law, the United Nations, and the limitations of sovereignty that allows for genocide to be carried out. I'd like to encourage everybody listening today and watching to push for a new world, not just a rearranged one, but one where the terms don't allow anything like what we're witnessing to ever take place again. And thanks for listening to this reflection. I will pass it to Kiki now and we can open this up a little bit more. Thank you, William. Your reflection is very similar to um, my own personal experience and how Palestine for a lot of us makes it so that we see this place more clearly, that we see the world more clearly. And that was actually the genesis of my, my experience, my sojourn, my beautiful encounter with Palestine was through a lot of pain, borders, um, my family had to cross two of those borders, Guatemala, Mexico, and Mexico, U.S., borders that are so new, didn't exist on Mother Earth, didn't exist on the planet, um, but have been so normalized as if that's just the way of the world. And so as I was studying geography, I decided to study how borders were constructed in Palestine, knowing that they were new. And that ended up taking me back to 1492, eventually, as I kept digging more and more, which made a lot of sense then to me about why I, why I cared so much, because I couldn't understand at first why I cared. I was in my ancestral lands in Chiapas on the Guatemala-Mexico border about to study that border when Israel's war on Lebanon exploded in 2006, and I couldn't stop looking that way and I, I eventually moved to Palestine and and had a life-changing experience. Um, so why 1492? Um, I'm so happy for you for, for our encounter Mohammed just by the way because you're um, Mohammed and I met in person at the Socialism Conference in Chicago in July, and we had actually known each other online for like 10 years um, on Twitter, I think, talking about geeking out about the Zapatistas. <laughs> um, and when I, saw, when I saw him in person at the conference, he was talking about 1492. And I was like, whoa, I'm writing a book about 1492. And we spent a four hour long evening just talking about it. And, um, and I do think that it, it's helpful to tell other stories in addition to the stories that we know, but new stories too, not to replace old ones, but to add. And so 1492 adds to the history of Palestine, the Palestinian resistance. Usually the story begins in the 19th century when European, European imperialism headed that way with Napoleon at first in the early part of the 19th century, and then with the Zionist movement of Europe in the latter part. And so a lot of the Palestinian historiography begins there. And so that I take it back to 1492, uh, it still has a lot to do with Palestine. And so I want to start with this map. Uh, I'm a geographer, so I, I talk a lot about maps and, and borders. So I'm going to show a lot of maps. This is a, a map of the world according to the European imagination. Um, it's a very medieval map that understood the world only to have three continents, Europe, Asia, Africa, and then Jerusalem in the middle, Palestine in the middle. So Palestine has been the center mm -hmm. of the world for Christendom, for European Christendom. And this map was actually created in 1581 after they had learned about us over here. So you see us in the corner. Um, and world maps stopped looking like this soon because the geography had changed, the world geography had changed. And soon what happened is that after learning about us here, the Portuguese and the Spanish monarchs, all Catholic monarchs started to fight 
over who was going to get to invade and conquer these lands. And so the Pope stepped in and drew a line in 1493 and 1494, so shortly thereafter. And I remember learning about it in school as the Treaty of Tordesillas, but it was never really interesting to me. And that's like all I can think about now. So like taking a world map, and cutting this line here, saying Portugal can invade everything east, so that includes Africa, which it did, and the Indian Ocean, and Spain can invade everything to the west, which is why right here where the line cut through which what became Brazil, is why Brazil speaks Portuguese. So this is actually the beginning, the inauguration of global linear thinking. So this is the birth of modern borders as we know them today. The world was not cut up this way before. This is what we call a God trick, the idea that you could play God, be above the planet and cut it up into objects to own, to possess. And what's really important to know about this line it is a peace agreement, a peace contract between the Europeans so that they don't fight on the ground. They have an agreement, a peaceful agreement, so that then, of course, the violence is meted out on others, not on the Europeans. So 1492 globally inaugurates global linear thinking borders, and it also inaugurates an above and below global uh, paradigm where Europe is above, Europe is protected, Europe is what becomes peaceful because it's warring a lot at the time and so they're trying to figure out a way to create peace in Europe and so they export their contradictions out to non-Europe, to us, where lawlessness goes, piracy goes, all, every kind of atrocity goes. But the point is that borders are meant to be agreements between the above over who is going to control what territory. They don't have anything to do with communities on the ground and the realities and the desires of people on the ground. So eventually we end up getting the uh, Aviala, so-called Americas, cut up into vice royalties that eventually become the state of Brazil, end up becoming the state of Mexico. They end up becoming states. And again, with the logic of borders being those peaceful contracts for the rulers above. And of course, they bring a lot of death and destruction to the below, a lot of pain. These lands have, for millennia, not had borders. They There's been migration up and down these lands, and you, you can know that by following the corn. corn uh, maize, domesticated maize needs human hands, humans and maize need each other on these lands. So where there's corn, there's been human migration and corn started in what is today called Mexico and has spread throughout all of the Americas, but the borders have really destroyed a lot. I want to pause to and talk about who uh, is coming to these lands to colonize Aviala. There's a lot of upheaval in Europe, and in particular in the Iberian Peninsula with Spain. The Catholic monarchs, who are the ones that financed Columbus on his trip, were also in a holy war against Islam. On January 2nd, 1492, the last stronghold of the Muslims in Spain, Granada, surrendered. And that was a big celebration because it had been centuries of battle, of holy war with the Catholic monarchs trying to ethnically cleanse Islam from the Iberian Peninsula. And January 2nd, the surrender of Granada marked the final battle. And Columbus was there in Granada waiting to then tell Isabella about his plan to sail west because he wanted and she wanted Jerusalem next. Remember how important Jerusalem, right, is to the minds, the geographic imaginations of Christendom. So that he wanted Jerusalem next, and this is something that Sylvia Winter talks about in her writings of 1492, how you know Columbus had this apocalyptic vision of the end of the world, and of course the battlefield for that apocalyptic is Jerusalem. And so there was also 
like happened in the Iberian Peninsula with the ethnic cleansing of the Muslims, there was also the ethnic cleansing of Jews, which had been going on for a while, but that solidified it. Because under Muslim rule in the Iberian Peninsula, Christians could be Christians, Jews could be Jews, and Muslims could be Muslims. There was a convivencia, like a coexistence. But with the fall of Islam in the Iberian Peninsula and the imposition of one way of just being Catholic only, it also inaugurated an, an, an imposition of one world, the intolerance for other worlds existing. So at the same time that we have in the Iberian Peninsula, the ethnic cleansing of the Iberian Peninsula of Muslims and Jews and anybody who's different, who's not Catholic, they force Jews to convert. And if Jews don't convert, they have to flee. And eventually, uh, Islam is not allowed either. And a lot of the Jews who are being persecuted, and not just Jews, many people, became the colonizers here. They shifted context where they were oppressed below and, and came here and were able to become above others. And it's, again, like the exporting out of Europe's contradictions to non-Europe which also took place with the enclosures under capitalism in those parts of Europe where capitalism was enclosing lands, turning the common lands into private property and kicking people out. Like England, for example, there was a lot of resistance to that. We don't really know it, but um, because it seems so normal now to just be a worker and be a wage worker at a factory or wherever, right? But there was a lot of resistance to that life. And because of that resistance, there was a lot of legislation that made it illegal to just be a vagabond. You actually had to go to work. And for people who were unrelenting and were still fighting for land, the contradiction was resolved by telling them that there was land in the colonies, in the new colonies, why don't you go over there? So the below, becomes above by shifting context and makes itself useful to empire. That's how empire allows the below to become part of the above, is by making oneself useful, which is very much Zionism. And sadly, the Jewish Liberation Project called Zionism. There are a lot of different Jewish liberation projects, like all over in Christianity and Islam, and, was, and this is Muhammad, your work is so crucial, and, in showing us also how there's these tensions that exist in all of our world. And there's like the, the power from above, the authoritarian, fear-based kind of politics, and the more egalitarian, love, respect of the other based politics. And all worlds have these tensions. And sadly, with, with Zionism, it was one response of many of Jewish liberation. And sadly, that's the one that asked empire for a place. And they had to make themselves useful by crushing others in order to be accepted. So this is very much um, a, a pattern in Europe, in modern Europe, in the last 500 years, is exporting its problems out. And as it was cutting up the lands here, it was also trying to homogenize, again, imposing one world forcing conversions into Catholicism, making it so everybody spoke Spanish or spoke Portuguese, depending on which colonizer they had, or spoke English here in, in the North. And so there was a lot of homogenization to be able to better control the population from above. And that happened also to Europeans. It reflected back onto them where they began to homogenize Europe into the nation state. So the nation state is a very new project, even though it's talked about as if it's just normal and human nature, and that's just what we've always had. And largely because our education system is so bad, and, and also our, especially geography, and especially in this country. And so the nation state in Europe grew, particularly in the 19th century, and was homogenizing a lot of communities to quote unquote unite. So like the unification of Italy destroyed a lot of different languages and the one Italian that we know is just one of many languages and that happened in the late 19th century, so the 1870s. 
as did Germany. Germany was one of the last to quote unquote unite to become a nation state and its military was growing. And so it was looking at the European imperial powers with envy and wanted to be part of empire. And so they called the Berlin conference to cut up Africa. And so this took place in Europe on a wall, cutting up Africa among the European powers peacefully, right? Again, this is peaceful contracts so that they don't fight on the ground. Instead, the violence was experienced and continues to be experienced by the people on the ground, by the communities on the ground because of these borders. And these are different colors of the European countries. And here it also in Asia, we get with Vietnam, we get France also colonizing Vietnam at that time. So at this time in the 19th century, colonialism was at this moment where they're trying to grab all land possible and map every square inch of the planet. And that happens in Africa and shortly thereafter, it happens with Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq. I mean, all of those places that we know today as nation states didn't exist as nation states, but they, they it was cut up. And this is a secret map during World War One as the Ottoman Empire is falling between the British, French and Russians over who's gonna get what territory. And as you can see, Palestine is in, uh, is in this darker air, a darker color and it was supposed to be uh, under British, French, and Russian protection, quote unquote. And there's also a little port, um, Akka, over on the Mediterranean in Palestine that was going to be just for British rule. And that was for a scheme to build a pipeline from the Gulf to the Mediterranean to feed Europe. And that's been in the plans for, for quite a long time. Um, so, with Palestine, you know, this happens in World War I, and it starts to get this shape from evangelical Christians from Britain and the United States who follow the Bible and start mapping out Palestine. And if you can see here, this is a map of Western Palestine because for them, the Holy Land extends out all the way to modern day Iraq. And they gave the U.S. Americans the task of mapping Eastern Palestine. And the U.S. Americans were not very good map makers. Um, but the British and the British Army military engineers were able to map Western Palestine, which had the holy sites. And the U.S. Americans messed up. They didn't map. So that accident of history is why we have this shape of Palestine, which ends up being cut up in 1923. And so very much the discourse of these evangelicals was about how God had given them Palestine at Jerusalem, the Holy Land, just how they had talked about these lands here with manifest destiny. And I just want to, I'll just wrap up this section really quick to show how this map of Sykes-Picot continues today as a desire. This is Benjamin Netanyahu at the United Nations. In, uh, this was two weeks before October 7. And after he gave this speech at the United Nations, I got a phone call from the compas in the camps telling me, you need, to, you need to see the speech, we're going to be done. This is him pointing out a map of Palestine saying that it's Israel, and then pointing out to all of the neighboring Arab regimes that Israel has normalized relationships with and made them green, and then gets a red marker and marks the pipeline that they're going to make. And now this is on the eve of Saudi Arabia normalizing with Israel. Uh, it hasn't happened, even though this and also on the ground, it was just understood it's going to happen. So October 7 has disrupted that. And it, and it also came um, after the Abraham Accords and all these other normalization schemes. So this is sadly the situation that surrounds Palestinians is that these nation states that surround them too are also imperial colonial constructions. And they are contracts with the above. Again, just like how it happened with us, just how, how it happened with Africa and continues to happen all over the world. Borders are contracts between rulers, peaceful contracts, and the violence then is exported down to the below. 
I'll pause there and pass it on over to Mohammed. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kiki, William. Uh, let me reiterate that uh, it's a tremendous honor. Uh, and thank you for the audience, but it's a tremendous honor for coming, uh, for, for you all listening, not just hearing us. Um, <clears throat> and for the contributions from my fellow compas. Um, I speak to you now from the unceded Anishinaabe and Algonquin territory in so-called Canada, and I just arrived back from Egypt about a week ago. Uh, probably the most suffocating, imprisoning um, period that I've struggled with uh, in my life, as a matter of fact, uh, perhaps more so than during the Tahrir uprisings or the so-called Tahrir uprisings. And I began with this land acknowledgement, not for the sake, and I will continue to say this until my last breath, um, um, to engage in some mundane, trite, um, polemic of solidarity, but rather um, because land acknowledgements are about intent, purpose, and action. Let me say that again. It's about intent, purpose, and action. What happened in Evolve on October 7th, um, Kiki knows this and her and I discussed this, um, 1492 is, is, as she noted, is incredibly significant. It's significant for lots of different reasons. Uh, in my mind, in my world, where I hail from, uh, and I, I'm sorry to, to break it to folks, uh, if this is slightly upsetting, this is a religious war. This is a racial religious war. And it's a racial religious war that has been ongoing for 600 years, almost. We live in a time in which it's very Orwellian. There's a liberal hollowing out of words, as William alluded to. Um, words are vital, words are important. Theory is a form of liberatory praxis, and to me, as Bell Hooks had noted, theory is a form of storytelling. But these are very troubling times. Empty and liberal hollowed out words like access of evil, war against terror, simulated drowning, preventive war, civilians killed are referred to as collateral damage, CIA kidnappings are referred to as extraordinary renditions. But the loss of words and their meanings is also significant to, to our own sense of selves, our own sense of being, our own sense of understanding of history um, and liberation versus resistance. And we need to be talking about liberation, which is proactive, as opposed to just resistance that is reactive. We need to be talking about thriving and not just surviving, which is also a form of reaction. And words that have been internalized, including by Muslims, arguably, and even by Orientalists, insofar as, for instance, Islam being mistranslated to submission. When Islam means anything but submission, because the word for submission in Arabic is actually khudua. Uh, Islam comes from the root three-letter word or verb, salama, which is obviously also uh, produces the word salam, peace. But salam means to willfully surrender, to willfully give, to willfully offer. So based upon critical choice, reflection, thinking. Unlike the word submission that assumes as Orientalists and as white supremacists, particularly liberals, that's where white supremacy in, in my mind, my, my knowledge, my understanding emerges from, and it's far more insidious, the white supremacy of the liberal than that of the right-wing conservative. But submission is used in order to cast the moniker of the savage, the ignorant, the benevolent, that merely submits. Other words, Islamic state that doesn't exist, and that has even been repeated by uh, militant movements as ISIS and Islamists and ISIS and Islamism is a problematic term within itself because it assumes the politicization of Islam as opposed to the fact that any idea, and I'd say this again, any idea is inherently both spiritual and political. Marxism has become a form of religion. Anarchism has become a form of religion. Capitalism has its own form of religion. The state has its own form of religion. These are religious entities. So there is no concept as the Islamic state, and we had to actually develop a word that meant the opposite of state to refer to this thing called the nation state. And the word that most Arabs use in the contemporary is dawla, but it means the opposite of state. It actually falls between two verbs, to rotate, bar, and zel, to go away. But we didn't have a word for state. 
that's the part of the violence of translation and mistranslation. The violence that anthropology, the linguistics would require of me, an Arabic speaker, to try and find a synonymous term that is non-existent for an idea that emerged out of white supremacy, European logics, European ways of not only disciplining, but governing and controlling the world, imperialism, colonialism, and what they disseminate of a mass psychology of fascism. Fascism is a mass psychology. We've had Islamophobia on the left, we've got queerphobia amongst Muslims and so on and so forth. But sovereignty in Islam lies in the concept of the ummah, the global polity, the global spiritual, ethical, political polity that is not necessarily guided by, again, an identity politics, but that traditionally included, according to the Medina Charter that the Prophet had founded, Muslims, Jews, Zoroastrians, Sabians, and even polytheists were bound together by the spiritual, ethical, political commitments that they shared. 1492, Columbus engages as Linda had mentioned in the conquistador invasion of the Americas. And that was preceded or coincided with the casting of the casting of Muslims and Jews as savages, there is the racial descriptor, and as heathens, as godless. That after that was obviously projected onto indigenous on our black kin. As Alan Michael writes in his books of God's Shadows, it goes deeper than that, though. Columbus actually described, and one reads the diaries, Columbus's diaries, this, this conquistador's diaries, described the weapons that were used by the Taino people of the Caribbean as Alfangis, the Spanish name for the centaurs that Muslims had used against the Crusaders. Hernan Cortez, the Spanish conquistador, had referred to the 400 Aztec temples as mosques. He referred to Aztec women as Moorish women. That was the reference point the Christendom Islam, he referred to Montezuma, the Aztec leader, as a sultan. But then that continued, as I noted, to be cast on to indigenous people as both savages and heathens that needed to be Christianized in a white European, blonde hair, blue eyed doctrine. And of course, once the ongoing genocide, because it is an ongoing genocide, um, insofar as indigenous people in the context of Turtle Island, this is a settler colony. America is leading this war. Canada is leading with this war. Israel is merely an instrument. And Israel had modeled itself on America and Canada and New Zealand and Australia and so on and so forth. But once the original inhabitants, indigenous people, had been genocided in order to steal the land, the land that is the source of spirit, that is the source of connection, relation, the land that organizes conceptualizations of the public, the private, that organizes our conceptualization of gender, our relations to one another, the land that is a subject, that it is not an object. Then slavery commenced. Transatlantic slavery was underway. And our African kin, my African kin, 20 to 30% of them who were enslaved and were referred to as infidels and savages and heathens were Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula and the West Coast of Africa. My kin, we are in a racial religious war, not conjured by us, but by white supremacy, by white crusading supremacy. And one that is very insidious in its nature because it counts on our play of an oppression Olympics, so to speak, for a moment with regards to the context of solidarity and the mobilization versus organization dynamics that are ongoing on the ground. And an oppression Olympics, and what do I mean by that? The conscription of African and Arab Jews who later become Zionists, who identify with Zionism in order to displace their Palestinian, Arab, Muslim, Christian, and Jewish kin. But not only that, this is the same logic that pitted black against indigenous and indigenous against black in the context of turtle islands. Black people were conscripted towards indigenous extermination, indigenous people were conscripted towards black enslavement. And hence we have black Cherokees, we have black Mi'kmaq in the context of Nova Scotia. But that should teach us the intertwinement of our struggles and our fires in relationships to one another. And so not playing into blood quantum. And um, 
essentialized conceptualizations of blackness and so on and so forth. Indigeneity is a non-racial and non-ethnic concept that way. It's very much synonymous with the Islamic concept of fitra. Before we learn to become individualist, before we learn to covet power, before we learn to covet wealth and money and superiority, and egomaniacal escapades, because we have to become wolves, otherwise we won't survive in this world. We learn to, we learn to connect with land, and that's what the fitra means to community to our very Mother Earth, who has her own timetable and schedule that doesn't really distinguish between an indigenous water protector, a Palestinian freedom fighter, and a white supremacist. She doesn't operate that way, and yet she's very rational. But this is a racial religious war, one that sought to pit an African and against an Arab Islam, against an Asian Islam, and so on and so forth, and to incite sectarian differences between Muslims amongst themselves. We Muslims, and I'm not meaning to romanticize or make of a utopia 1,400 years of Muslim history, for we have committed a great deal of error in so far ourselves, having lost the path of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the message that the Prophet, peace be upon him, had originally brought that resembled the same message as Moses as Isa, peace be upon them too, and arguably as Buddha and so on and so forth. There are many paths to the same creator and Islamic knowledge. We have created you from different tribes and nations so that you may get to know one another. So you may get to know one another and the best amongst you are those that occupy, that, that exercise piety. And what is piety? It is in the name of social justice and the cause of justice. So this love for the delusional promise of the American dream with its genocidal past, its homicidal present and suicidal future, seems to want to be one that has allured us and captured us all. But it runs counter to the selectively quoted anti-American Muslim, Malcolm X, who referred to as the American dream as an American nightmare. And unfortunately, this is something that we have to come to situate and grapple with and understand that American societies, that Canadian societies are not secular societies. They are built on white supremacist religious doctrines as the Magna Carta, as Manifest Destiny, as doctrines of discovery, as terra nullius, as the Protestant ethic that defines conceptualizations of property, as common law property rights, as Victorian notions of gender and sexuality. And of course, this white supremacy, when it seeks to impose itself via the V imperialist escapade elsewhere, solicits reactionary, both secular military, as well as neoconservative religious responses on behalf of Islamists. Islamists see that Islam is a central component of who they are. Kiki had touched upon, the, and so did William, on the word, the term, the verb, the verb, solidarities. Solidarities, of course, of the above, the petro monarchies with Zionism, Egypt, that is the second jailer of Gaza, Jordan with its Treaty of Wadi Araba. It also betrayed Palestine. But that should make us think about the context of strategy versus tactic in the context of the unfolding mobilizations on the ground there. You see, we've lived this and we will continue to live it. Not long ago, Black Lives Matter mattered and they should and ought to matter every single day of our lives. But what does Black Lives Matter mean in the context of Africa that is the size of North America, East and West Europe, and China and Japan all combined together. That's how big Africa is. That has been and continues to be ravaged and pillaged. Make no mistake, we are facing multiple genocides. The Congo. Look at how Russia has used Islamophobia against Chechnya and in Afghanistan. Look at how China has used Islamophobia against the Uyghur. Look at how Myanmar has used a conservative Buddhism, a militant Buddhism against the Rohingya. Look at how Hindu Taba has used and continues to use Islamophobia against Kashmiris and Dalits and Malayali people or Christian. Islam is a quintessential signifier. And so in this moment, it becomes very crucial not to be reading OBL's Letter of America as much as it is important to understand the context of Islam and the valiant resistance of Palestinians that not and are not only Muslim, but there are Christians that are Jewish, that come from many different paths again to the same creator, but to situate Islam. As Kwame Turi, the great Pan-Africanist revolutionary, put it, 
for us as people of color, spirituality is a fundamental component of what it is to be revolutionary. So let us not secularize, let us not white bleach the significance, the historical, material, symbolic, spiritual significance of 1492 with its ramifications right now. We need to think about tomorrow. Because if we don't think about the alternative of liberation tomorrow, we're on the course of having lost Tahrir Square and the co-optation, as it happened with BLM, of Tahrir, of Noda Koda, by armchair activists, by celebrities, be it in the media, be it in academics, from all walks and all places of life. But Kwame had also asked us to reflect on the difference between mobilization and organization. He pointed to how Malcolm was a great mobilizer and organizer, and how the revered, and he ought to be revered, Martin was a great mobilizer and not a great organizer. What mobilization does is it mobilizes people around issues, single issues. But those of us who are revolutionary are not concerned with issues. We are concerned with the system, the settler colonial system on the very stolen land in which after life to slavery projects, stand your ground laws, school to prison nexus are continuing to evolve. In which black people are being referred to, have been referred to and continue to be referred to by soft imperialist Zionists as Bernie Sanders, as super predators and before him Hillary Clinton. That's the danger of liberalism. Mobilization usually leads to reform action, not to revolutionary action. We need to think about the role of violence not to fetishize it, it has a role. It's a tactic, it's not a strategy. Decolonization is inherently violent, as the beloved Fanon teaches us. We need to think about its role, though. Or are we not to resist annihilation? Or do we simply prefer Palestinian corpuses, black corpuses, indigenous corpuses, the corpuses of women, children, the elderly, of men, of blooded, brutalized, starved, injured, kin, in which, and who face a condition in which all facets of life have been destroyed. I do not want to really exceed or too much, take too much space beyond that. I honestly don't know how much I've been talking and, and that's really irrelevant. One can go on and on. I was reading mere statistics today and it's, you know, forgive me for, for sharing that, but one, one shudders and faces a great deal of difficulty even wrapping their heads around numbers. 24,142 killed, 9,420 children, 4,910 women, 22, 4,020 civilians, 48,901 injuries, 81 journalists killed, 1,840,000 displaced, 62,840 homes destroyed, uh, 171,220 partially destroyed units, 134 damaged mosques and three churches, 462 health staff targeted with 214 deaths and 247 injuries, 131 targeted health facilities, 56 clinics and 51 ambulances. We need to think and allow me to conclude with this. Land acknowledgement, where I began. Our investment in settler colonialism here in the society that is leading this war should push us to oppose it in full here. This goes further, and I have all the respect to the very direct action, but this goes further than the pickets, than the teachings, than BDS campaigns, than blockading arms manufacturers premised on short-term crisis management and performative land acknowledgements. What is our role here? Because of land back is relevant as it should be with regards to every inch of Palestine. It should be relevant to every inch over here. And I'm inspired by my compas, like I said, William, Kiki, and so many others, so many others, Erin Mills, Kewalani Kanunu, Gord Hill, Hersha Walia, Leanne Simpson, Robert Maynard, and so many who are inspiring and teaching alternative ways of thinking through liberation. We need to redream dangerously again. We owe it to ourselves, to our children, 
who has Mumi Abu Jamal said, come from infinity and are the arrows that we shoot towards immortality. Thank you again, and we'll open up the floor for a discussion and questions. I don't know if there are any any comments we want to take from the public, but I'd like to I'd like to add to your thoughts, your feelings, um, just for just a little bit, Mohammed, and and also Williams, because I think so much about you know more concretely, like how is it that Palestine allows us to see so much more that we couldn't see, and you know when we talk about fascism and fascism as a mass psychology. And I just want to preface this by, by saying, I think it's really important that we learn each other's texts, different worlds texts. And one of the books, I was reading a lot of books before I moved to Palestine that summer of 2010. And mm-hmm. one of them were, the, were, were the, the two books, the prison letters that George Jackson wrote while he was in the dungeon. Um, seven years solitary and wrote it in the 1970s, wrote his letters in the early 1970s. And his second book, which was not edited, Blood in My Eye, it got him killed a few days after. And in it, he talks about fascism and he has a theory of fascism that says that the United States is the most advanced fascist society. And I read that in 2010, it had been written in 1971. And I was arguing with him because I was about to move to Palestine and he hadn't seen Israel yet. And so I was like, I don't I think that maybe Israel is more fascist. Um, so when I moved to Palestine, I remembered a lot about what George Jackson said because for the way that he described fasc- fascism uh, was by calling it reform, which is what you're talking about, Muhammad. Mobilizations lead only to reform. And in particular, he was talking about economic reform, so capitalism, whereas capitalism had made it seem as if it was the ultimate enemy superhero against fascism. It actually was the leader of the pack because it's in a more advanced form, meaning that there isn't as much resistance to it as before, meaning that there are people, societies willing to be a part of it, part of capitalism, you know, shopping, for example. And I thought about that a lot as I was in Palestine. And I lived in Bethlehem and Bethlehem and Jerusalem are very close, but Palestinians are not allowed to go to Jerusalem if they're on the opposite side of the apartheid wall, which Bethlehem is right up against. And Every once in a while, when I would go to Jerusalem to study for in my for my Arabic lessons, I I would I would observe Israelis shopping. It's a very divided city. There's East Jerusalem and there's home demolitions taking place right before your eyes, and then there's West Jerusalem, which is very Israeli, and reminded me a lot of the Santa Monica promenade in LA, the shopping area, where people were just shopping. And completely oblivious or not caring to what was going on all around them in, in it. And all of those modalities can coexist according to which one is most effective at any given moment. And I noticed this in Israel. I noticed it far more than when I came back to the United States, all I could see was Israel. And so when I see a map like, like this of Palestine shrinking, I'm so grateful that more and more the conversation is showing this to the United States and more and more conversation is being had among Palestinian Americans themselves that they're settlers too and they need to confront that contradiction too because it is a global issue. It's not just global, it's planetary, which is why I say um, had to deal with before. They have had to you know, climate collapse is basically 
what, what our generation is confronting. This is our generational task. And what that means is we need to get to know each other's worlds. Religions are worlds. Whether we call them that or not is irrelevant, but that's what religions are. And if we're secular, if we don't understand ourselves to be religious, we still have a world that we need to deal with, we need to grapple with in an ethical way, in a political way, and at the most basic, try to figure out how we're going to ethically ethically relate to the other, to the stranger, to the one who's different. And, and that is the challenge that humanity has had since humanity's been around, and not just humanity. I mean, what makes animals an animal, and we're animals, is that we have to eat other life in order to sustain our life. So we have ethical questions every single day to deal with what are going to be the limits to that? What, what are going to be the characteristics and the relationship and the regeneration of that, right? And that's what a lot of uh, theologians are, you know, are dealing with, which I, for me as someone who takes very seriously the Zapatista call for a world where many worlds fit, not just a world where we all can live and are the same a world where many worlds fit, the people who are talking about that are the people who are talking about those huge questions like God, like life, what is the meaning of this, of, of this existence? So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Kiki. You know, one thing that you you said, uh, Keith, I know that there's some some questions in the chat, and maybe um, after I just add this point, maybe uh, Muhammad, you could dive into a question or something. Mm -hmm. One thing that you you said, uh, Kiki, that um, really stood out to me when you were talking was you you pointed out this pattern of Europe um, exporting problems and contradictions around the world, and it really uh, connects with what you were just talking about with regard to fascism, because I think that sometimes there's a um, there's this debate that plays out over, about what fascism means. And I know that when you look at um, the way that people who come from the Black Power Movement and across the spectrum of the Black radical tradition talk about fascism is more expansive than this single moment uh, where people think about uh, Mussolini and Hitler. Mm -hmm. um, it's much more expansive than just World War II for uh, people, uh, Black radicals and intellectuals, scholars, revolutionaries, and uh, many people across the Black radical tradition, fascism is the embodiment of uh, so many of these contradictions that go back to 1492, that go back to 1492. Um, and even when you think about the origins of the United States, and when you think about the settlers, the, the, the pilgrims coming here, fleeing um, religious persecution, and the way that national mythology and um, U.S. nationalism positions this as a sort of romantic story of perseverance and people overcoming oppression to build up the greatest country in the world. You can see so many of the parallels there with Zionism. You can see so many parallels there with um, the propaganda and with uh, the mythology that reinforces uh, Israel's genocide. And it's so connected to what the United States uses to justify its genocide against native people here, what it uses to justify its uh, enslavement and its um, immeasurable harm through US imperialism around the world. It's all justified by the fact that there's this romance, this origin story, this national mythology that tells us because a group of people were getting away from oppression and fleeing persecution that they had to commit um, immeasurable harm, violence, and genocide to build up something where everyone would be free. The parallels there with Israel are just 
are, are just all in front of our face. And I think that that is why for so many people across the spectrum of the black radical tradition, um, especially the, the theorists and revolutionaries that come out of the black power era, uh, the people like George Jackson, uh, like Lorenzo Cambor Urban, like Martin Sostre, who are thinking about fascism and drawing this analysis, they're not seeing just this one particular moment where we name something fascism. They're seeing the whole spectrum of this connection going back to the very origins of the conquest of what got called the new world. And so I think that it's important for us to make that distinction, um, to be able to understand that when this debate about what fascism is or isn't comes up, there is a much more expansive um, way for us to think about this and to also position that in relation to the formation of what we know as the nation state um, today and what that means uh, with regard to the nation state coming out of uh, colonialism. So I, I, I really was just wanting to add that to what you were saying, Kiki, because it was just kind of burning in the back of my mind. I know that we, we have some questions too, though I don't want mm -hmm. to talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Liam and Kiki. Uh, so our, um, our first question is, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, Pranav uh, Goel, this was amazing. I'd love to hear more thoughts on language as we see how fascists and genocide supporters are trying to distort the language of liberation and resistance. So that's the first question. Uh, I can read them all or just take them one at a time. As, as, what would you prefer? You can read them all. Okay. The second one is uh, by Trinity. Uh, I'm overwhelmingly uneducated on this topic and want to know where to go that isn't from a liberal perspective to get more information. What resources do you all suggest to start with to be better equipped? Uh, and then Joe, organizing mobilizing is happening a lot in the settler colony I'm in right now. Um, it's rot, performative, and oversells its non-impacts as victories over and over. How do we move to that shift to undermine the colony, the settler colony? That's the third one. May I take the one on, on language in particular? Not. Well, thank you for that. Um, Thoughts on language. I think about language all the time because I'm realizing that we use words differently. <laughs> like I'm trying to, you know, <laughs> um, even capitalism, you know, even among anti-capitalist comrades, their, their definition of capitalism is very different than our working definition in my community. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't have any, anything really to say about that that would be helpful other than we really need to talk about how we're using words rather than assume that we that we are um, that we carry the same uses for them or the same meanings for them. Um, and it's being distorted a lot for sure, and it can get caught up in that. So like anti-Semitism, for example, intifada is now another one. Intifada means shaking off and it's being translated as genocide. Um, anti-Semitism itself was a European construction against Jews in Europe, calling them Semites, that they belong in the in the continent given to the son of Noah Hashem. <laughs> it's a very um, it's it's very twisted because they make it seem as if now, I mean, Judaism has is is in crisis, is an enormous crisis right now, and has been with the state of Israel in a similar way that happened with Christianity under Constantine, under the Roman Empire. It's co-optation. Christianity was a revolutionary movement. Jesus of Nazareth is understood as a revolutionary in Palestine and a martyr. And for centuries, it was understood as a movement against empire that was eventually captured by empire and said that, you know, the empire is the closest thing to God now. Constantinian Christianity. And there's been battles since forever among Christianity about the nature and shape and form of Christianity. A lot of the Christianity that we know is very painful, very oppressive, especially on these lands. 
there are a lot of Christian Christians who are rebellious, are liberatory. You know, there's these traditions in all of our world. These um, in all of our traditions, there's these tensions. I mean, there are these tensions in all of our worlds over how it is that we're going to treat others. Are we going to treat others based on a politics of fear that we believe that the enemy, that the that the foreigner, that the that the stranger is always an enemy? Or are we going to treat the other as just a myth? You know, the other's just a mystery. I don't know yet. And those are questions that. Uh, our tensions in all worlds, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, with Judaism, it, the, a huge crisis has taken place, of course, with, with Israel. The Holocaust was enormously an existential crisis for a lot of Jews. Like, where was God? How could God allow this? And Zionism steps up and says, well, the state of Israel will never allow this. And kind of like takes the place of God as the secure of the people. And so that's what the state of Israel has been so successful at and is what we're all battling against as well. And our Jewish relatives have been battling all their lives and many new ones are coming into the fight, realizing what's happening. It's over the soul of Judaism as a religion of justice and of love for the stranger rather than a religion of empire which is what Christianity has always had to had to go through as well. Is this a religion of creation or is this a religion of empire? And in our movement circles too, all of our movement circles that, that you know, whether they're secular or not, we have these tensions of authoritarianism and anti-authoritarianism, right? And and it's it's this battle between them. So I think that if we can understand the world as this dynamic this dynamic tension of intensities and, and, and trying to recognize which ones we want to be a part of intensifying rather than just that's just the way it is and which one do we want to pick? No, which one do we want to intensify and which one do we want to detensify? What part of the world do we love and want to grow? What What is a beautiful, like, for example, when I think about survival, there's a, there's a Palestinian who wrote that survival brings out the best, most creative, or the worst, greatest atrocities of human beings. Just this question of survival. So how are we going to engage with this question? And it sadly, the state of Israel has engaged us with this question through a politics of fear, making it seem as if Jews are the only ones that can live there um, safely, which is of course not true. So t- intensities, tensions, movement, I think help me uh, more than just the words, because with language, yeah, I need a, I need to deconstruct like what it means to me and how others are using words, because, you know, that's how we can get to th- this deeper realm of ideas too. I think that if we're actually talking about ideas and feelings, like huge questions, ethics, questions of ethics, then get, then we kind of get away from a lot of the words that we lo- that we learn whether we're in like a leftist movement, like there's a lot of words that the left uses a lot. And so you kind of adopt it and don't really have a conversation about how we're using that word, right? We need to have those conversations. And as we're talking about ethical questions of the world and how we're going to be in the world, I think it it can help us get there. Well, yeah. I'll just say really quickly, uh, in terms of the question about the how do we move to shift to undermine the colony and, and about organizing and mobilization, um, there's a lot of different things happening. And a lot of times when we observe um, struggle, we tend to feel um, you know, inspired or, or maybe disillusioned or frustrated based off of the things that we see that are the most visible representations of uh, resistance. Um, and I, I, I would stress that it's important to remember that we don't always see everything that's happening on the ground. Um, the most visible uh, organizations or the most visible activists or thinkers or who are radicals, whatever the case may be, do not represent the whole of a resistance. And so I don't want to make any blanket statements about um, what is or isn't going wrong. Because what oftentimes happens when it comes to 
um, struggle, especially in these very um, uh, high, highly intense moments like the one that we're in, is that you see a lot of pontificating, you see a lot of uh, sort of proselytizing and people saying what the movement needs to be doing, what is getting wrong and uh, what people are failing to do. And oftentimes, if you just go back um, a few years, uh, a decade, a couple decades, a generation, you'll see these repetitions of people saying that pretty much um, verbatim in all of these historical and significant moments uh, through, through, throughout the past. Um, and the way that it comes into the present should remind us um, that we can't necessarily predict and measure or foresee what's going to happen and what's going to be most effective or what's ineffective. I think that it is um, important uh, to think about uh, moving towards more organization and towards more collective and uh, mutual uh, shared uh, forms of struggle that uh, do not uh, get us in a place of isolation and um, individualism or uh, thinking uh, that we were, were better off being alienated. Um, but at the same time, I don't want saying that to become this uh, sort of traditional uh, talking point that isn't uh, being true to the fact that we do need alternatives and we do need innovative and new uh, and uh, much more radical ways of organizing and organization and thinking that are not just replicas of what came before, because we can always just quote somebody from the past and talk about what they said that we would need to do in a moment like this. But there's more to it than that. This is this moment. And we have to be in this moment and in community and in connection and in struggle with people around us so that we can make decisions based on the conditions that we're currently living in and not just based on a nostalgia that we have for what might have worked before. So we need to be in connection with uh, the Palestinian struggle, with people who are experiencing um, and uh, experiencing this bombardment and under and trying to survive this genocide to be able to make decisions about how we can best contribute um, rather than just letting our uh, our politics uh, guide us into, like I said, this, you know, when I made my initial comments, this sort of posturing where we already have the answer because our ideology tells us what the answer is. Our politics dict dictate to us what makes sense on a level of um, understanding the many problems of the world around us, but they're not a, a religious tenets for us to um, uh, have a, a predecided solution or answer to problems that are always changing in a world that's always changing. So basically what I'm saying uh, to make a long story short is that there is no one answer, but we find the answer through struggle and through community and actually building with people around us um, not letting our our preconceived notions uh, lead us. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, if I may just uh, take a quick um, job, I guess, and, and build on what William and Kiki uh, had noted uh, uh, very poignantly and, and, and aptly. Um, maybe I'll start off with, with uh, what William was in well, both of y'all sort of noted this, um, but alternatives, um, you know, uh, slogans can only get us so far, you know, in, in Tahrir Square, the, the, the slogan was bread freedom and social justice. Now you ask two people even of the same sort of ideological background, what that means to them, and they'll give you different answers. But these are the sort of conversations that need to happen now. With a proviso that we do need to embrace a certain non-ideological slant. We need to focus more on the ethical, political commitments that inform the ideas. Are we, are we interested in anti-authoritarian organizing? Do we understand the value of that, right? Versus hierarchical modes of organizing. Uh, how, when, where? But it's about creating sustainable alternatives. As the Quran teaches us, Hamas, the resistance shows. Well, I do not must talk in the I prepare for them what it is that you that, that that what it is that's necessary. And the Prophet peace be upon him, by the way, and Muslims during the early period, they were forbidden from engaging in defensive acts. 
Uh, and for the simple reason that they needed to learn how to build community first. And that was the greater lesson in terms of migrations when they were evicted and had to leave, actually, Mecca and first migrated to Abyssinia and then later on to Medina. They had to learn how to become community kept together in the face of the persecution that we're facing from the, tr the tribes that they belong to, their parents, their families. We're talking about children, elderly, sons, daughters, fathers, the, the complete unraveling of one sense of being, of one sense of grounding, in order to build with others that they now share ethical, political, spiritual commitments with, but also with the people that they went to and, and were in migration or went to, to be in migration with in the context of, again, Abyssinia or Medina, who weren't Muslim in the context of Abyssinia. It was the Christian king, and it was predominantly Christian population. It was the Christian king, Najis, who later on embraced Islam and so on. Uh, on, uh, yeah, he later on embraced Islam, uh, close to his death. But it's about creating alternatives. Revolutions involve practical questions. What are you going to do with, you know, the police? What are you going to do with the army? What are you going to do when somebody gets sick? What are you going to do with the trash? Basic fundamental questions, but they don't just involve structures that exist outside us, albeit that's part of it. They involve the building of sustainable alternative worlds of below to counter those worlds of above. But they also involve our own transformation. This is why Islam teaches jihad and nafs, the greater jihad is the struggle against one's inner microfascisms. I've been socialized with matriarchal, patriarchal privileges that I will have to contend with till the day that I'm six feet under. I will only have to learn how to listen to others and not just hear them, particularly women. I need to be okay with engaging my emotions Is a healthy uh, feminist, um, understanding and becoming of myself as opposed to embellishing in my over machismo everything that society tells me I need to engage in, uh, in relationship to the white man, in relationship to white structures, and so on and so forth. So they do involve our transformation, uh, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. And here, you know, just to go back to, then, you know, all we learn from oppression is learning how to repeat it. So if we're going to speak to the context of, again, the creation of alternatives, sustainable alternatives with others, then we need to also talk about an ethics of disagreeing, because we can't assume, as Kiki had noted, that we're using words the same way. We are already internalized, and the system has internalized within us conceptualizations of one another, words in relationship to one another. Right. And, and we need to make space and we need to make space on the land to, to sit down and do that. We can't do it over social media and over Twitter. Um, and, and, and this is how, you know, the state is not this abstract entity that exists over and above us. We already govern one another vis-a-vis -vis the set of capillary relations of power, of economics and so on and so forth that exists between us on a day to day level, on a horizontal level, not the level of the streets. So we need to have an ethics of disagreement in order to deal with. The differences between us. We also have to have an ethics of hospitality and how to offer hospitality to, to one another, to welcome one another, to spend time with one another. But again, that, that needs to happen on the land. Um, and, and it can't just occur in the fury in the moment while we're standing on a block protesting, right? It can begin there, but we need to invite each other to each other's homes. We need to cook with one another. We need to learn about one another's traditions and so on. Uh, this is the difference between sort of solidarity again as a verb and super, superficial acts uh, of it simultaneously uh, at the same time. And, and this is how words begin to get some semblance of, of meaning and we begin to again undermine fascism that way, inner fascism, external fascism, um, and the fascistic structures uh, that are there, you know, and and yeah, that's a big. There's a big difference between totalitarianism and, and fascism. That way, fascism operates in all frames, in all directions, um, and all vectors. Totalitarianism operates from the top down. Trump wanted to become a totalitarian, like Kim Jong Un, like like Xi, like like Putin, and so on and so forth. But fascism operates differently. Who isn't authority? Who? Who of us doesn't, on some level, comes, covet some sort of authoritarianism as a consequence and, and power individualist when push comes to shove because we've been weaned by the nation state as sort of our father, our Oedipal father, and capitalism as our mother that teaches us to materialize everything, love, friendships, absolutely everything. When it comes to survival mode, we, we, we're all capable of having these fascistic impulses. This is why there's a mini Obama, mini Mussolini inside each and every single one of us. But this is where humility becomes very important. Um, and again, that comes by actually investing to get to know one another as communities. 
uh, we're, we're not individuals, we're networks of relations of power. And, and you know, and, and I don't mean community just with the people that we like, but I'm talking about communities when we go grocery shopping, the grocery clothes store clerk, the homeless person on the streets, wherever it may be, people in shelters, wherever it may be, wherever we may encounter with one another as potential sites of liberation that way, an investment that are worthy of um, are belonging to one another. And at least traditionally speaking, and history has taught us this, that it doesn't take mass mobilizations to change the world. Look, look what 1,500 warriors were able to do, to whatever extent that we agree or disagree or partially accept or whatever, Hamas or not. I, I, I have my own critiques or whatever of Islamists in general. But, but, but ultimately, support the resistance. But look what 1,500 people were able to do with the fleets of your America that they bought, the nuclear submarines, the F-35s, the ballistic weapons, for Gaza, for Gaza, for Hamas. And Hamas is an idea. You can't kill an idea. Malcolm wasn't large in numbers. The BLM weren't large in numbers. The BLA wasn't large in numbers. But look what they were able to leave us in terms of legacy that way. So look at the Zapatistas and what they've been able to accomplish for decades as an inspiration. So, so we, we, we do have ancestors. We do have elders. And the last thing, is, as William had noted, is let also our Mother Earth guide us along the way. We don't need to have all the answers for, for everything simultaneously at the same time. And that doesn't mean that we should be immobilized. This is the beauty of the Quranic term of and concept of al-ghayb, the unknown. Our mother has much to teach us. So let, let us also allow her to guide us along the way to with this idea of freedom and liberation, but a genuine one, a decolonial one, an abolitionist one means. So. I'll... I'll I'll, I'll maybe, I'll conclude with that note. I, I, I'd, I'd like to reiterate again my, my immense gratitude, our gratitude, if I may, to, to Haymarket uh, uh, for, for organizing and allowing us to, to hold this event. Um, my utmost love, respect, admiration, uh, companionship with uh, my fellow compas, who I love so dearly and I've gotten to know. <laughs> Uh, you know, much better over the last while, and I can't wait to continue to get to know them and build with them and grow with them and mature with them. Uh, Kiki, Linda, and William, uh, I'd like to thank you, the audience, uh, for for your grace, for listening, for coming, and I hope you benefited and um, that this uh, that this gathering has served to inspire alternative ways of thinking about Palestine, about Turtle Island, uh, about liberation. So thank you. Thank you.